year, we found through our research that leaders of businesses and organizations do in fact have the power to close the gender gap in career advancement and pay. Creating a culture of equality where everyone can advance and thrive unlocks human potential. This year, our research goes one step further by exploring the link between cultures and innovation. Launching next week, this survey highlights connections between culture and innovation, all while offering insights into how companies can further their diversity imperatives. Powering innovation through equality is a mission we're deeply committed to at Accenture. And I'm excited to share that by 2025, we will achieve a gender balanced workforce. And by 2020, women will account for 25% of all managing director positions worldwide. We've seen firsthand at Accenture that when leaders create the right culture, employees see a difference. Companies need to create an environment where employees are empowered to speak up and speak out. They must put robust processes in place to provide a channel for employees to raise concerns about harassment or discrimination in a safe work environment without fear of retaliation and with confidence that the company will in fact take action. St. Marshall's journey is the embodiment of someone who has taken on today's most pressing workforce challenges. And as we heard last night, she is the first female African-American CEO in the NBA, blazing a trail for all of us. But more than that, it's about her exemplary leadership. Exemplars like St. Marshall remind us that business leaders, as business leaders, we each have the power to create an environment where people experience a real sense of belonging and can be who they truly are and be their best, both personally and professionally. We hold the key to creating a workplace where everyone can win. Thank you, Sint, for setting the bar high and holding leaders accountable. Thank you all for your time and most importantly for your support in this critically important initiative. I'm now thrilled to turn the podium back over to my dear friend, Black Enterprises Chief Brand Officer, Caroline Clark. Thank you so much, Michelle. Okay. We've heard a lot about Scent. And a lot of you know Scent. We're so driven by data now, I'm just going to drop a few data points on Scent to bring her out. At 58 years young, having spent more than 13,000 days working at AT&T in 15 jobs in three cities, she retired to start her own consultancy. She was happily hanging out with her husband of 35 years wearing Warriors sweatpants and Steph Curry socks. <laughs> when a call came in from Mark Cuban, who she had never heard of. Shark Tank, anybody sent was like, no. <laughs> what? No. That call changed the entire trajectory of her career. It has now been about 380 days since she walked into the Dallas Mavericks organization with a 100-day plan to create a new playbook for women, for cultural transformation, and operational effectiveness, a playbook that is being adapted throughout the NBA. Now 59, she is not only the first African-American woman CEO of an NBA franchise. As of last night, she is an inductee into the mighty, mighty Women of Power Legacy Sisterhood Please give a rousing welcome to our power forward, St. Marshall. Here, you sit here. Ride 
baby. Okay, I won't sing, I promise. <laughs> Don't, yeah, no, y'all like, please, sis, no. Okay. Hi, Sam. <laughs> How you doing, girl? I'm good, I'm good. We were back there uh, with Bishop Vashti. Oh, my we, goodness. We were dancing. It was, a, mm. it was a mess. Thank you, Bishop, again. Yes, thank you, Bishop. So, yes. Sint, Sint said to me, Sint and Bishop Vashti just met here at the summit. And both of them knew of each other but had not met. So, Sint's backstage and she goes, Girl, it's gonna be dangerous in Dallas now. <laughs> I was like, just invite me, that's all I ask, invitation. So since, um, you know, one of the things that we're really focused on this year at the summit is this whole idea of living your life by design and not default. And it's difficult to do because of course, most of us end up living in the default zone, right? right? There's right. so much that we can't control. One of the most powerful things about your story, and it is such a powerful story, is that from the very beginning, um, there's been so much difficulty in your life. Um, and you've moved through it from the very beginning with tremendous intentionality from my perspective. Can you talk a little bit about your childhood? We met your mother last night. Is she precious? Where's my mama? <laughs> Is she out there? There she is, right there. Wait, hey, Ma! That's how, that's how fine I'm gonna be at 82. Uh-huh. You will be for sure, yeah. jeans. Um, but, but talk a bit about your mother and about how she shaped your ability to navigate through those early years and the forces that were pushing and pulling on you all. You know, thanks, and it's, it's so good to be here, and thanks for the fabulous <laughs> award last night. That's oh my so gosh, welcome. that's like the best Our thing pleasure. that's ever happened to me. Thank you, thank you. Well, I guess my husband, he's here somewhere, maybe he's the best thing ever happened to me. Okay, <laughs> maybe the award is second. Okay. Way to fix it. <laughs> uh, you know what, I tell people, even though I went through a lot in my childhood, I, I believe I had a good childhood. And I think my story is a story that a lot of people have. Uh, just growing up, uh, what I had is something very special, and that is a mother who really taught us it's not where you live, it's how you live. And she taught us to have faith in God and to believe that truly it's not about what happens, it's how you respond to what happens. So I learned at an early age that bad things happen to good people, that sometimes the light at the end of the tunnel is a drain. I mean, it's not all good stuff. I mean, sometimes bad things are coming. And I've always watched my mother respond uh, with intention, with prayer, with a plan, with what's next, even if she couldn't execute it on it right then. I mean, I watched my mother go through uh, domestic violence, and I watched her have a plan to get us out of it. And so I think that is just in me that something good is going to happen. Um, Jeremiah 29 and 11 is one of my favorite scriptures that says, for I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper and not harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. So I'm always focused on that future. And so even when my father told us we were going to be hookers on the street without him, my mom embraced us and she said, I responded and said, that's not gonna happen. We're gonna be one of the first in the, our family to go to college, we're going to help mom, get out of these projects, and she had two and three jobs, so she could do it herself. We just wanted to be a part of it. And I was going to be the president of something one day. I was 15 years old. Now, I didn't just make that up, okay? I didn't just make it up. Something, my mother, they, my mother put something in there a long time ago that I just stand on, and it, it's a sense of optimism and the fact that I know there's a future and I need to always have hope. Well, you don't only have hope, you have outsized confidence it seems. And I know you've described yourself as a very confident child, but sort of bookish and quiet. Hard to imagine you quiet, Sint, but okay. I was, I, I'm serious. I, my dad says I didn't really start, my, my mom can attest to it, I didn't really start talking a lot until the seventh grade. Uh, I would just sit, I mean literally even when we were riding around in our big white station wagon, I would just sit and add up license plates. I mean, I, I'm a math person. That freaks people out. <laughs> Because, you know, I'm a people person, uh -huh. and so, you know, I work for these people and so, with these people, and sometimes, you know, these men are in the room and the CFO, and they try to slide something by me. I'm like, hold up, baby. 
Hold up. <laughs> Hold up. I love numbers. And so I would just sit and at uh, license plates. I mean, I was just quiet. I was, you know, kind of introverted. Yeah. And then I got a best friend, Pam Isley, in the seventh grade, and I haven't stopped talking since. Okay? <laughs> I haven't stopped talking since. It's just, it just came out. It just came out. Well, when you talk about being optimistic about the future, um, part of the confidence was, you know, you knew you were smart, you always got good grades, you were a math head, went into college as an engineering major, yes. shifted over, but you also went into college with a boyfriend. <laughs> the laugh. <laughs> and then... I had two boyfriends, tell, but... Tell ahead. the story, because... <laughs> but no. I'm, I like numbers. <laughs> Okay. Oh, Lord, no, if somebody said, takes me this, I guess, but, but he knows I had two, and he won, so it doesn't But no. <laughs> <laughs> but tell the story because I think the intentionality around the relationship piece of your life yes. is worth mentioning in this room. Yes. Uh, so my first week in college, uh, my boyfriend, who was in Fresno, California, uh, the other one had gone off to college, so I had to get rid of him. But the one who was in Fresno, California, called me, uh, and it was his second year of college. And he said, hey, I have a surprise. He said, I've transferred schools so I could be near you. I'm at San Francisco State now, and I want to see you tonight. And I said, hold up, boyfriend. Uh, I have a surprise for you. I will call you the day I graduate. I said, you know, I'm very focused. I have stepped foot on Berkeley's campus. You know, if you've ever been on Berkeley's campus, the big Sather Gate, and the big Campanile, and everything was just so big. And I said, it's just time for me to be big. And in order to do what I need to do here, I need to focus. And that was one word that my mother would use with me, my educate, my teachers and my principal used, focus. And to this day, I have four words that I just live my life by. Dream, focus, pray, and act. And so I was focused. And I said, I'll call you when I graduate. And so I think I saw him once or twice, and I just said, I, I can't do this. I will call you when I graduate. So I graduated June 14th, 1981. So I'm giving you my age. And I called him at 3 o'clock. And he, I said, hey, Kenny, this is sent. And he said, sent who? <laughs> <laughs> is he in here? Where is he? Is he in here? I said, send, he said, sent who? And I said, boy, don't try to act like you don't know me, OK? <laughs> I mean, come on now. I said, he says, I haven't talked to you in almost four years. I said, well, I told you I was going to call you when I graduate, and I was fired up. See, I was talking by then. I said, oh, I said, I just graduated. And I mean, I said I was going to call you when I graduated. It's 3 o'clock. I graduated at 2 o'clock. I mean, dude. <laughs> it's like, give me an hour, OK, to get out of my gown and stuff. And in fact, where's, my, where's Yvonne Belier? Stand up, Yvonne. That's my best friend from college, OK? And so Yvonne, Yvonne was standing there, so she can attest to this. She's like, girl, don't call him. Don't call him. I said, no, no, let me call him. Let me call him. She's like, ah, girl, don't call him. I said, no, let me call him. So I called him, and I said, uh, my mom's having me a party at 6 o'clock. I just graduated. I'm going to start work uh, for the phone company at the time we call ourselves. And he says, I, I can't come to the party. I'm engaged. And I'm like, no, 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 that's the wrong answer. Boy. <laughs> I told you I was going to call you the day I graduated. <laughs> I said I was focused. I kept my end of the bargain. I was focused. I had things to do. I told you I was going to call you when I graduated. I graduated an hour ago. My mother's having me a party at 6 o'clock, dude. Let me tell you how this is going down, OK? My mother's having a party at 6 o'clock. Ma, where's mom? Mama knows she's having a party at 6 o'clock. And I told her, I said, Kenny's going to come to the party. And see, he would go by and see my mother, but because he couldn't see me, right? And I said, well. My mother's having a party at 6 o'clock, you need to be there. And to this day, people ask me what happened to the girl. I don't know what happened to her. He came to the party. <laughs> <laughs> he came to the party. <laughs> you know what? Beyonce has that song that say, if you like it, then you ought to put a ring on it. He put a ring on it. And it's been almost, let's see, April the 30th will be 36 years. 36 years. Thank you to the party. <laughs> and I tell him all the time, he really did come that close to missing his blessing. <laughs> Talking about he couldn't come to the party. The Lord had a jewel waiting for him. True, true. <laughs> 
So there you have it, ladies, intentionality in all aspects of your life. It's very important. So, so let's, talk about, let's talk about the last year of your life. Okay. Um, this speaks volumes about you. When you heard about this job, when you knew this was a lock for you, you could have called anybody. You could have called the Journal. You could have called Sports Illustrated, um, which broke the story on the Mavericks. You called Butch, and Butch called me. I love Butch. <coughs> and, and I love Roberta, too. And Scent created the opportunity for Black Enterprise to break the story of her going to the Mavericks. Now, what that, what that speaks to is not just, you know, friendship and women of power and all that. It speaks to who you are as a person and what you truly know and understand about diversity and inclusion and what we need to do in our community in business to get ahead. Yes. Um, but it seemed to me, because we spoke that morning just before you had your first press conference. Yes. Sint was like in the car, pulled over, you know, she was just like a whirling dervish, but, but getting this in. And I think it seemed to me that day you got shot out of a cannon. Yes. I mean, into the spotlight. Mark Cuban was sitting next to you, but you were like, I got this, let me. Um, but the whole year has gone on. You came in with a plan, you knew what you wanted to do, and you have accomplished so much. I know how it looked, but how did it feel to have your career pivot in that unpredictable a way and that rapid fire time with that much visibility? It, it felt like, truly, I knew the Lord was doing something. I didn't know exactly what it was because I was uh, working with Karen Carter, who's out there. She's amazing, uh, the chief inclusion officer of the Dow Chemical Company. Now she's also the chief human resources officer. So she's both. So, so we were on a mission. We were on a mission doing some things to help to transform uh, the culture of the Dow Chemical Company. But this came up. And just through a series of circumstances, praying and all that, I knew it was um, the right thing to do. Uh, you helped me a lot that day, and I don't know if you realized it, because when we were talking and we were, you know, you were getting the stuff for the story, and I said, you know, I'm going to focus a lot on diversity and inclusion, and so then I gave you my line about, you know, diversity is being invited to the party, inclusion is being asked to dance, and you said you can't use that today. You remember that? Mm -hmm. You said you cannot use that today. You said I love it, I love the lesson you teach about it, I love all that. You can't use that today because of what you are walking into. You, you don't need the men to try to have the women to dance. That's exactly what we don't need. And I stopped. And that's when, that was the moment that I truly realized, and I'm so glad that you told me that. That's when I realized the magnitude, actually, of what I was getting into. It wasn't about just coming in to deal with some misconduct and all that. This was really about women. This was about something big. This was about things that had happened. and. I really needed to focus on transforming the culture. So right then, I felt a little bit of weight. I mean, I was glad that you stopped me from doing something stupid in the press conference, okay? But I felt a little bit of weight, and then I got to the press conference, and once I got to the press conference, I knew I had a plan, and I actually wrote the plan on an airplane. I was on my way to my um, mother-in-law's surprise birthday party in California, and that's when Mark said he wanted to have a press conference. And I said, what are we gonna talk about? He said, whatever you want to talk about. <laughs> and I'm like, well, you know, I don't even really know what's going on in there, but okay. And I just, that's when I came up with the 100-day plan. And once, once I laid it out, I felt a sense of relief and thought, okay, we're going to do this. The beautiful thing was I didn't know who I was going to take in there because, of course, you cannot do anything by yourself. I mean, I learned that in college. We used to have, yeah, you go ahead and we need each other. We need each other. And... I said, Who, who's gonna go in here with me? And fortunately for me, when I look at all the text messages, the emails, the phone calls that came in, I am not making this up. About 2,500 people from AT&T called me and said, whatever, or text me, whatever you need, I'm right here. Now that was beautiful because, you know, I couldn't go back and poach. So to have 2,500 people call me, and I kept the records of it, okay? So if they ever wanna come at <laughs> They'll do that. If I ever, if they ever want, <laughs> if they, if they ever want to come at me, I got the records, okay. And so, fortunately, uh, Tarsha Lacour uh, called me, as did Cindy Wells, and you know a few others that I actually needed. 
and said, okay, we got to do this. And once I got them in there and around the table and met the fabulous, fabulous, fabulous people, especially the women uh, at the Dallas Mavericks, I knew I could do it. It was all about people. Yeah. It was heavy, but I knew I could do it once I met the people and got others around me. Were you at all intimidated? I mean, you were pivoting into an entirely different industry. You know, no. No, uh, probably because uh, early on, because remember, it happened right before the Women of Power Summit. Right. And so you arranged for me to meet Kathy Francis. Is she in here? Yes. Where's Kathy Francis? Stand up, she sister. We, call, we called it, we walked in the other night, we said it's the scene of the crime. <laughs> so you arranged for me to meet with her. Right. And we spent, what, a good two or three hours uh, in the coffee, coffee shop. Right. And then, of course, I met Pam Eel. Where's Pam? And so these women in sports, I mean, they, they just embraced me, and I just thought, no, I can do this. Yeah. Because I have them. I don't need to, you know, it's, it's great to learn the industry, right. but for the job I needed to do, I needed to be a leader, and I needed to be somebody who was bold, and it was actually good that I didn't know the people, because some of them, like about 12 of them, I was going to have to say goodbye to, so I didn't know them, so it wasn't personal. Yeah. You feel bad about it, but you got to do what you got to do. Yeah. Uh, but the place needed leadership and bold leadership, and I knew I had that because I had demonstrated it for 36 years. Yeah. You walked in, and one of the first things you did was talk to every single person in that organization. Every single person. Um, in spite of the investigation, you wanted your own one-on-one -on -one feedback. What did you take away from that process? Because we talk a lot about Me Too, but you really have been in the very center of it. Right. Um, and I know you had a lot coming in, but what most impacted you? Well, I, I met with every single empo employee, 140, one-on-one. -on -one. And I would start my one-on-ones off by saying, give me your whole life story. And then they would start with, this is my fifth season at the MAV or my 12th season at the MAV. And then I'd say, were you born here? Because <laughs> I wanted your whole life story. Okay, so then they, they would go back and give me their stories. And what I gleaned from all these stories is that I had a lot of people in my organization that truly came to work for the Mavs to have a career in sports. Not just a job, but a career. And especially for the women, that career was not taking off and not coming to fruition the way they wanted it to because of what was happening in there. And so it was big for me to be able to understand these people and what drove them. I want to know their families and truly get a feel for the 140 people who the Lord had literally put in my hands overnight to help change their lives. So it became bigger than basketball. Right after that, it was much bigger than basketball. In fact, if you look at our mission statement and the vision statement, and we, we, we did a business planning process from the ground up, you never see the word basketball in it. It's about the fan experience and extraordinary workplace culture and these 100 and probably 80 people now that the Lord put in my hands uh, to make sure they had careers and their families are okay. It became very, very personal after I spent time with those 140 people. When you got this job, you, you said um, something to me that day. You said, you know, I have come to understand your initial reaction was, who would want that job, really? Well, yeah, after I read that article, I'm like, well, woman wants to work here. Right. Some bad stuff happening up in here. Right. And I'm not the one. <laughs> <laughs> But then, but you, but you pivoted very quickly from I'm not the one to I'm uniquely qualified yes. for this, which is exactly what you said yes. when you found you had stage three colon cancer. That's exactly what I said. You yes. said, I am uniquely qualified for this. So speak to that for us for a minute. What made you uniquely qualified in both of these extraordinary circumstances and really, really difficult ones for these roles? Okay, I'll take the cancer one first. Uh, so when I got diagnosed uh, with colon cancer, stage three, one lymph node away from stage four, a pretty bad prognosis, uh, but I knew what I stood on. And I, I know I, I stand on the promises of God. And so I knew that the, Jeremiah 29 and 11, okay, I knew there was a plan. And when I told my mother, I called California and I told my mom what was going on, and her initial, her immediate response was, this is for his glory. She says, God is going to use this. It is going to be very public, and you will tell a story and bring people to him through this. And she hung up the phone. And I thought, well, that ain't what I'm thinking about right now. 
<laughs> I, these people told me if I don't have chemo, I might not be here in six months. I kind of like not thinking about that right now. And the more I thought about it, and the more it, the story started to break and things started to unfold, I realized I was uniquely qualified for it. I had a very public job, so my story would be very public. I had um, just a, a support base across the country, literally with AT&T, from California to Texas to North Carolina, across the country, people wanting to do things. Uh, great health insurance, a big mouth, so I would tell the story. Strong, I had faced adversity in my life before. I had four second trimester miscarriages, a daughter who died at six months old, a husband with brain damage who they said would never walk and talk again. He's about 90% back to normal. That's less brain damage than he had when I married him. So, um, <laughs> And I tell him that all the time. I tell him that all the time. So, so I, have, I have gone through a lot. All y'all women who are married, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Okay, you can get them 90% all the way there. That's good. Okay, so... <laughs> Okay, so I knew, I knew that the adversity that I had faced in my life, it's like, okay, it all lined up now, and I had to stand on all that. And he's never failed me. He's never failed me. And I'm willing to talk about the fact that he's never failed me. And I'm willing to talk about where my help comes from. I'll grab a microphone and preach. In fact, let me digress for a minute. When Mark Cuban, when Mark Cuban talked to me and he said, I said, well, I need to go home and pray about this. He said, well, you know, I'm not really a religious person. I said, well, I'm not either. I'm a spiritual person. I said, if I come in here, I said, if I come in here, you might be speaking in tongues by the time I leave. <laughs> <laughs> you, you could just see him. He was like, okay, okay. I said, oh, no. I said, you know what? If you tell me one thing and the Lord tells me something else, I got to go with what he tells me. So you just need to know all that before I come in here. So I knew I had something working in me that has been working in me since I was 17 that uniquely qualifies me to handle whatever he puts in front of me. Yeah. yeah. So I know that. Yeah. I hear that. I hear that. Um, and in, in, a, in addition to that, I prepare a lot, and the Lord has blessed me to where, you know, I am smart. I mean, I'm just, the Lord just blessed me with, with that. Um, and so... I prepare a lot. I'm very into people, so I will take the time to dig into their lives, what's going on, uh, and all of that. And, and you have to be able to do all of that to lead, especially to lead through a crisis, whether it's personal or professional. And I've just had a lot poured into, poured into me to where I'm just uniquely qualified for some of this. Yeah, and, and what you're speaking to with that and your discussion with Mark Cuban, which, which you talk about often, is values-based leadership. Yes, You're yes. really big on, so break that out for us. I'm big on it, and in fact, I brought my phone because even though we didn't uh, plan, I know you. And so I knew you were going to ask me that, and I couldn't, okay, so let me write them down, ladies, or get your phones, whatever, okay? Here are my nine values, and you've heard me talk about them before. You've heard me uh, speak talk to them. Yourself. Go, go, go. Okay, do your thing, sister. Okay, so values-based leadership, nine things. Respect, and my hashtag there is be nice to people. You just have to be nice to people. You just don't know who you're talking to, what their stature is, and it doesn't matter. You just need to be nice to people. My favorite book is The Power of Nice. The second one is authenticity. Y'all probably figured that out. Look at somebody and say, do you. Do you. That's me, do you. And you have to know who you are. Now, 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 some of you, we just you don't need to just get crazy when you walk into work, okay? <laughs> Do you to a point to where it's professional. <laughs> I've had to remind myself that sometimes of uh, team members, I'm like, okay, they're being authentic, but you know, I need them to do them to a point. Um, faith is one of my values. Uh, I keep him first no matter what. I mean, no matter what, uh, God comes first. Uh, integrity. Speak the truth. Integrity matters. Character matters. Fun. I like to have fun. I take time to celebrate. I teach lessons through, and hope, hopefully we'll have time to do one at the end. I teach lessons through fun. I like to have a good time. Teamwork. I talked about that. No man is an island. Fairness. Fairness. Every voice matters. Every person matters. And that was a big deal when I walked into the Mavs. The place was not fair to women. And that's a huge personal value of mine. Uh, which it, it helped that it was a personal value of mine. Uh, action, I'm, be about it. 
You don't just talk about it, be about it. You can put your plan together, but at some point you have to act. And then family, and having family as a priority. And that's when I say you have to know your crystal balls from your rubber balls. What things can you miss? What things drop? They shatter, they never come back. Those are crystal, you can't drop them. Rubber balls, they come back, they bounce back. I can't make it to every soccer practice, I can't make it to everything. I have a rule, I show up to the first day of school, the second day of school, and the last day of school. The first two days, kind of fake the teachers out, so they'll think I'm gonna be there and all that. <laughs> And then, and then my kids, I don't know if Shirley's in here, because Shirley used to always threaten her teachers and say, my mommy will come back, and she'll have a meeting with you, and she's got a book, and she writes stuff down and all that. So, so I show up the first two days, and then the last day, because I'm sending them a signal of how important education is. So those are crystal to me. I can't drop those. And the rest of it, I just do the best I can. Do the best I can. You... Um You mentioned the importance of family, and you, and you touched upon it a little bit earlier, but I'm, I'm adopted, you're an adoptive mom. Um, we both feel really strongly that adoption is the best thing that happened to both of it us is. from both sides of the coin. But there again, there was a default, right? Your road to motherhood did not go the way you thought it would, right. and at some point you had to make a plan, but I think your story about that is interesting too because you weren't really driving no. the road to motherhood for you. My husband was driving it. I, uh, after we had, after we buried our daughter, uh, I just went into really a state of depression. And finally one night, and this was literally about six weeks, six or eight weeks after my daughter died, six and a half months old, and he, I said, just, you know, I'm not dealing with any bureaucracy anymore. Just go find some adoption agency. Just pay him the money and just tell him to leave me a baby on the doorstep. And I was serious. I said, I'm just, I just need it to happen. Because, you know, I'm used to, you know, I'm intentional. I make, you know, stuff happens in my life. So this wasn't going according to plan. And I just came home one night and he said the agency wouldn't take our money because there are too many kids in our county, in the poorest part of our county, that need families. And so we're going to a meeting tonight. And I said, I'm not going. And he literally picked me up and put me in the car and said, we are going. And when I walked into the meeting, you know, I'm a happy person. The social worker said I walked in with a lightweight attitude. And that's true because I didn't want to be there. And two seats were in the front. We were a little bit late because I didn't want to be there. And I sat down and this man started talking about, um, you know, the process takes a year or two, and I said, great, because I didn't want to be here. And I guess my little attitude was coming out, and I'm on the front row. Um, and the social worker said when they walked in, they looked at my husband, and they said, this man looks like he could be Anthony Young's father. And Anthony Young was a little boy who literally that same day at 5 o'clock, the meeting's at 7, that same day, they signed a plan to put him in a long-term group home, foster care group home, because there was no plan for him. And so the other social worker said, she looked and she said, what are the chances they want a two-year-old black boy? And she says, none. Everybody wants infant girls. And so when I was filling out the form and I told my husband, I said, I'm not doing all this because I want to go home. And the guy heard me. And he said, just write your name and what kind of kids you're interested in. And I wrote my name and I wrote two-year-old black boy. And the social worker literally was standing behind me. She started crying, and she, and she literally just grabbed the paper from me. And I looked up, and I guess you know, I must have had a little attitude or something. Uh, <laughs> but I was also crying. And now I'm also crying. I was also crying. <laughs> I was crying, and so she says, why are you interested in a two-year-old black boy? And my husband told her, he said, because we just lost our infant, an infant girl. And so we don't want to replace her. Right. Pretend like you know we're trying to replace right. her, and that's why. They literally called me the next day. The papers were already on the judge's desk. They had to go the next morning and take the papers off to say, we think we have a family. Is he here? Is, is he in the room? Is my boy in the room? Stand up. That's that boy right there. <laughs> He's mortified. <laughs> nah. He loved it. He's faking my it. Kid, no, my kids think they're famous because they're adopted. They, they have, because they have, they've been on TV and all that, right? They have no stigma about it, and they will tell you that the Lord 
rescued them. One thing we tried to instill in them is, and you know, he picked both of his sisters off television, and then his older brother we adopted. So I, when he moved to college, I said, give me the remote control. Okay, I got the Wednesday's kid, I got the Friday's kid, it's five days in a week left. And so, but they will tell you that the Lord made our family and he put us all together and they want to adopt and they want to do all that. And so they, they, they're famous. Yeah. And it's no stigma associated with it at all. This is how the Lord made our family and it's a good looking family. So, so Sin, you know, this is one of the things I love about you. There's, there's no stigma associated with adoption with you. There's no stigma. You never felt a stigma, um, even with all that was happening in your family when you were a child. Your no. father broke your nose, you go to school with a brace on it, and you're still the head cheerleader, and you're like, what? Now, what's Good. the problem? All these right. teachers are coming to me, I'm like, right. what? No, but no, but no. Did stigma. I mess up a move? Did I not <laughs> kick right? But, but I mean, no sense of shame. You just never take on any of that that the world can try to put on us. No. And you're, you've moved into a situation at the Mavericks in the midst of a Me Too nightmare, right? Yes. For an organization, and more importantly, for the people in the organization. And there's enormous sense of shame and stigma around these things. What do you want to say to these women, some of whom may be dealing with issues in their organizations or communities or what have you, and others who may be trying to manage those who are, about how to navigate through this particular space in a way where you come out whole and the organization prospers as well? I think if you are a leader in an organization where this is happening, you have to have a plan. You have to acknowledge that it is going on, that it is real, and have a plan, get people around you to execute on that plan, set a time frame, set a date that says as of this date, culture will change, this will be a place where we will value diversity and inclusion, you will see it, we're not just gonna talk about it, we're gonna be about it. And here is the plan to get us there. If you're not intentional about it, it won't happen. We were very intentional about saying by the end of the year, we would be the global standard for diversity and inclusion in the NBA. And my NBA sisters are out there somewhere. Yes, we were very intentional about it. As a person who has actually gone through the crisis, and fortunately for us, we have people who did not leave, that they stayed right in there and they were hopeful that a change would be made. We had to provide counseling, and we still do, and I would say get counseling. There's nothing wrong with counseling, nothing wrong with a therapist, absolutely nothing wrong with it. And so we made that available to people. You have to trust in the people and trust the process. The right people have to be put in place and you have to speak up. Our big thing was developing a speak up culture and modeling zero tolerance. And so when we took personnel action, when things would happen, we talked about it and we let people know, yeah, they're not coming back or this has happened. But for women who are not in a speak up culture, what do they do? They find somebody they can speak up to. It may not be in your workplace. So that, that, that's why this is so fabulous. That's why this is so wonderful. There are 1,500 women in here. You can call somebody in here and tell them what is going on and they will help you. How many, I mean, when I first got this job, I mean, that's why I ended up feeling so confident. I had you, I had Pam, I had Kathy, Katrina's out here somewhere. We talked at the US Open, she gave me some tips. You, this, that's that Hasu moment. Gotta hook a sister up. I've been waiting for okay? it. Okay? I've been That's waiting, I've been waiting for two up. days. <laughs> Hasu! There are 1,500 people in here to practice Hasu. There's nothing, nothing that we should go through as women, as women of color. And yes, white women are in here with us too. There's nothing that we have to go through by ourselves. There's just too many of us. We can help each other get through it. Somebody in here has been through what you are going through and can help you get out of it. And sometimes you might have to leave. Sometimes wherever you are, you might just have to leave if they won't change. Yeah, yeah. We have time for maybe two questions. <clears throat> two questions, there's a mic right here. I should have announced it earlier, I apologize. But if anybody has a question, you can hit the mic. Um, 
Diversity and inclusion is something you have lived and breathed for your entire career. Yes. You transitioned through a lot of jobs at AT&T, but you've been in diversity and inclusion as a leader for quite a long time. You've yes. seen it evolve. You've seen a lot of organizations pay lip service. You managed to achieve things in one year that other organizations have talked about, and the needle has not really moved. Right. What's at the crux of that, and what can we as people throughout organizations do to help propel that process because it's right. it's not moving fast enough. I think what's at the crux of it is you have to truly believe the business case for diversity and inclusion. You have to really understand and believe that your results would be better because at the end of the day, it's about results. It's about profit and loss, all of that. There is data to prove and anybody who wants it, I can give it to you. Uh, Karen Carter, I know so many people, Eric Mitchell, Corey Anthony, there are all kinds of people in here who can give you the data, where you make better decisions and you are more profitable when you have a diverse group of people around the table. So it starts with a fundamental belief of that. If you don't believe it, you'll have 10 white men around the table and then you'll end up with a big scandal. But if you do believe it, you'll end up with better results. Once you believe it, you have to put a plan together, which is what I've always done. And you go out and get the talent is there. This jazz about we can't find this person and that person, that is like so old, it's ridiculous. We're out there. We're out there, we have skills, we have experiences, we are educated, we know what to do. You want something done, you get a black woman. Hello. You get a black woman. Hello. I'm sorry. <laughs> we can get some stuff done, because we've always had to make a dollar out of 15 cents. Okay, I mean, we just know what to do. You get, you get some black women, but you can't get all black women. Okay? Because then that's diversity. the You need diversity. diversity. I mean, you need somebody from some other cultures and all that, because, you know, we'd all be doing the same thing, and, you know. Uh -uh. Right. You know. We have a question. Please, very quickly. Yes, uh, can you quickly rewind to when you first started 100-day plan, transition into the organization. Talk about the difference between needing to take an aggressive leadership approach and saying this is the mandate, this is what we're doing versus being able to really incorporate the opinions and the, the, uh, the work of those that it is that you're working with to get the buy-in. What do people across different levels of the organization need to consider as you think about that leadership approach? Great question. What's your name? Tiana Cunningham. Thanks, Tiana. You know, you got to, you get, you got to get your 10 seconds of fame, sister. PepsiCo. It's Tiana, 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 Tiana Cunningham. Tiana Cunningham. Tiana Let's go. <laughs> Okay, I said 10 seconds, baby, okay. 10 seconds. Okay. Okay, so, <laughs> okay, so good question. And, I, and I, was, I was able to do both. Because in the plan that we laid out, I laid out the plan. I had to. We had a crisis. I was qualified. I laid out the plan. But once I laid out the plan, we got others involved in it, and we got people to own different pieces of the plan. We brought in the whole leadership team and others. Then when I had my one-on-ones with people, I would find out what they were passionate about and what they're really good at. So we'd put them on different projects. And then the big piece was we built our business plan from the ground up. We had everybody in the organization be a part of the business plan uh, to own it. So everybody was involved, but I actually did the plan because sometimes you can't wait. Sometimes you just got to do what you got to do and then you involve others in the process and those who have a problem with, they don't work there anymore. Thank you. <laughs> you want to do your thing? Now we're good. Do you want me to? Okay. Are they ready? Okay. So since oh, there's a question over there. Oh, do we have one more question? Go right ahead. Actually, I don't have a question. I have a comment. My name is Natalie Cole. Natalie Cole. <laughs> I'm for from our weekly newspaper. I've known Cynthia probably for about Girl, I've known you years. forever, Natalie. And I just want to testify on this sister because she is so fabulous. And when you're climbing, since she was at AT&T, it's, it's worth a hand clap because she is the real deal. I found, and I'll make this very quick, I found myself sitting at senior level meetings uh, with AT&T all the way up to the president of mm -hmm. AT&T. Cynthia was his right hand person at that time. And I was treated with such respect. I'm a small business owner, and I was treated with such respect and such love across the table from Cynthia, because sometimes meetings like that can be very daunting, and I just want to tell you that 
you are the real deal. I loved the fact that when you went over to work for Cuban, and uh, I'm just so happy to see you here today. I love you. It's so Thank good to you. see you. Thank you so much Thank for being you. an example for all women. I Thank you. you. I love you. We have a question over here. Okay, we can skip my piece. We can, we, no, we can go. We have time. How you doing? Hi. What's uh, your name? Leslie Hansen. All right, Leslie. Uh, I work with VMware. Woo <laughs> Okay, my question is the things that led up to you getting the call from Mark Cuban. Mm -hmm. How did you build your brand that you got to him and he called you without you even knowing him? What advice can you give to us that we can take actionable, tactical, so that we can build our brand and people think of us without having to go to them? Here, and that's a good question. And the way I just, I've, and I have that, talked about this before. You know how we talk, we, I talk about the Hasu moment. Hook a sister up. The white men have been practicing for years. Hook a brother up, okay? And so he got to me through hook a brother up. He was talking to some of his, you know, I guess, rich little buddies. And he, would he was talking about what was going on and my name came up three or four times. And he reached out because they were looking out for him and they were trying to help him deal with his problem, which is what we need to do. And then I got the call. That was it. It was the hooker brother moment that he practiced. And I got the benefit of it. Mm -hmm. Butch was teasing me about being in my blue. He said, you're in blue all the time. I'm like, yeah, I work for the Mavs. I used to work for AT&T. Some people's money is green, my money is blue. <laughs> but but to, to her question, how intentional have you been through the years and has it changed? in terms of promoting yourself beyond your organization? No, I have, I have not. In fact, even right now, um, as you know, I was on the Today Show last week, I turned down more appearances than you can shake a stick at. I don't like that. I don't like being, I mean, b believe it or not, I don't like being out front. I say no to 95% of it. It's about the people. And the test that I have is, how will this help the brand of whoever I'm working for, whether it's AT&T or the Mavs, how will it help the people? And even with the Today Show, I said, tell them if they will come here first, talk to the people, go to a game, experience our African-American Heritage Night. And yes, I was on the court standing with Dirk. It, that's the first time, bitch, I didn't have on blue. I had on black, red, and green, the color of the top. That's right. <laughs> and so I said, they have to come and experience the people. And if they do all of that, I'll go to New York and have an interview. And they called my bluff and they came and they did all that and so I went to New York because it's always, I never, honestly, and I know that's probably not right and especially, you know, you're the brand officer. <laughs> and I, I never focused on yeah. my brand. The Lord says your gifts will make room for themselves. And I always practice that, I always practice that. Um, so one of the things that you always say to women is know your worth. Yes. <clears throat> You have to. And these are the sorts of things that we say all the time, right? But my question is how? You how do you do that? You sit down, first of all, what I like to do, and there's this book um, that I've read called More, and it has some, it's or, More by Todd Wilson, M-O-R-E. And it made me stop and think about who am I? What's my passion? What's my purpose? What are my strengths? What do I bring? And I don't focus on the things, the opportunities, because you know, I'm 59 years old, and some stuff it just is what it is. And if I, can, if I can't do it or don't know how to do it, I'll get some people around me. And so you focus on your strengths and you say, okay, what is it that I'm truly supposed to do next? Some of us are just in the wrong place or in the wrong fields or with the wrong employers. Some of us are getting you know, notices, severance notices, and we're all afraid about it when the Lord is trying to open it up and get you to do something else and do what he called you to do. I mean, I look at where I am right now and think, wow. This is like pretty cool. Okay, I'm, I'm kind of glad I retired. I mean, it, this worked out just fine. But you have to truly know what you bring and everybody in here, you bring something very special and something very unique. We're all uniquely made. You need to find out where exactly does that fit. And that's what this networking is about. I read a lot too. And so that's why you have to read and you go to different conferences and you pray. I mean, that's what I pray about. But what's, once it's revealed, you gotta act but I'm, I'm very intentional about that. Lord, what's next? What is it? Where do you want me? I ask two questions, even when I go into a job. And in all the times I change jobs at AT&T, I ask two questions. Lord, what is it that you will have me to do for this employer? 
because you got to deliver the goods. I mean, period, you got to deliver the goods. What is it you'll have me to do, and who is it that you will have me to touch? And once those two things are revealed, I'm ready to rock and roll. We are so glad, Sin, that you touched us today, and we cannot wait to see what's next for you. I love you. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. I love you. Okay, come on. This is my diversity and inclusion lesson. Diversity is being invited to the party. Who knows how to do this? Ten people, come on. She is too come on. Come on. Everybody gets to dance where I am. Come on now. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Teach somebody how to dance. Teach somebody how to dance. Ow, Carla, ow, come on now. Ow, ow. Teach somebody how to dance. Come on now. Come on now. Come on now. Come on now. Teach somebody to dance. Okay, this is it. The whole room, come on down, teach somebody. Come on now, to the left. Come on now, not kick. Yes. All right, that's it. Everybody gets to dance. Woo! I love you, girl. I love you, girl. I love you, girl. I love you, girl. Oh, thank I love you so much you. again. I love you, girl. I love you, your words. I really love you. <laughs>